for everyone that's been following and reading along with me on the Dresden Files Stormfront. I'm very sorry that I haven't been posting in a while. But here we go. Chapter 8. The Dresden Files Stormfront by Jim Butcher. By the time I got home, it was after 2 o'clock in the morning. The clock in the beetle didn't work, of course, but I made a pretty good guess from the position of the stars and the moon. I was strung out, weary, and my nerves were stretched as tight as guitar strings. I didn't think sleep was likely, so I decided to do a little alchemy to help me unwind. I've often wished that I had some suave and socially acceptable hobby that I could fall back on in times like this. You know, play the violin, or was it the viola, like Sherlock Holmes, or maybe twiddle away on a pipe organ, like the Disney version of Captain Nemo. But I don't. I'm sort of an arcane equivalent of a classic computer geek. I do magic, in one form or another, and that's pretty much it. I really need to get a life. One of these days. I live in a basement apartment beneath a big, roomy old house that has been divided up into lots of different apartments. The basement and the sub-basement below it are both mine, which is sort of neat. I'm the only tenant living on two floors, and my rent is cheaper than all the people who have whole windows. The house is full of creaks and sighs and settling boards, and time and lives have worn their impressions into the wood and the brick. I can hear all the sounds, all the character of the place, above and around me, all through the night. It's an old place, but it sings in the darkness and is, in its own quirky little way, alive, its home. Mr. was waiting for me at the bottom of the stairs that led down to the apartment's front door. Mr. is an enormous gray cat. I mean, enormous. There are dogs smaller than Mr. He weighs in just over 30 pounds, and there isn't an undue amount of fat on his frame. I think maybe his father was a wild cat, or a lynx, or something. I found Mr. in a garbage can about three years before, a mewing little kitten, with his tail torn off by a dog or a car. I was never sure which, but Mr. hated both, and would either attack or flee from them on sight. Mr. had recovered his dignity over the next few months, and shortly came to believe that he was the apartment's tenant, and I was somehow he barely tolerated to share the space with him. Right now, he looked up and meowed at me in an annoyed tone. I thought you had a hot date, I told him. He sauntered over to me and rammed one shoulder playfully against my knee. I wavered, recovered my balance, and unlocked the door. Mister, as was his just to do, entered before I did. My apartment in a studio, one not-too-large room, with a kitchenette in the corner and a fireplace to one side. There's a door that leads to the other room, my bedroom and bathroom. And then there's a hinged door in the floor that goes down to the sub-basement, where I keep my lab. I've got things pretty heavily textured. There's a multiple carpets on the floor, tapestries on the wall, a collection of knick-knacks and oddities on every available surface, my staff and my sword cane in the corner, and several bulging bookshelves, which I really will organize someday. Mr. went to his spot before the fireplace and demanded that it be made warm. I obliged him with a fire and lit a lamp as well. Oh, I have lights and so on, but they foul up so often it almost isn't worth turning them on. And I'm not even about to take chances with a gas heater. I stick with the simple things, the fireplace, and my candles, and lamps. I have a special charcoal stove and a vent to take most of the smoke out, though the whole place smells a lot of wood smoke and charcoal, no matter what I do. 
I took off my duster and got out my heavy funnel robe before I went down into the lab. That's why wizards wear robes, I swear to you. It's just too cold in the lab to go without one. I clambered down the ladder to the lab, carrying my candle with me and a few lit lamps, a pair of burners, and a kerosene heater in one corner. The lights came up and revealed a long table in the center of the room, other tables, almost three on the walls around it, and a clear space at one end of the room where a brass circle had been laid out on the floor and fastened into the cement with U-shaped bolts. Shelves over the tables were crowded with empty cages, boxes, Tupperware, jars, cans, containers of all descriptions, a pair of unusual antlers, a couple of fur pelts, several musty old books, a long row of notebooks filled with my own cramped writing, and a bleached white human skull. Bob, I said. I started clearing space off the center table, dumping boxes and grocery sacks and plastic tubs over the brass circle on the floor. I needed room to work. Bob, wake up! There was a moment of silence while I started getting some things down from the shelves. Bob, I said a little louder. Come on, lazy bones. A pair of lights came up in the empty sockets of the skull, orangish, flickering like candle flames. It isn't enough, the skull said, that I have to wake up. I have to wake up to bad puns. What is it about you that you have to make the bad puns? Quit whining, I told him cheerfully. We've got work to do. Bob the Skull grumbled something in Old French, I think, though I got lost when he got to the anatomical inappropriateties of bullfrogs. He yawned, and his bony teeth rattled when his mouth clicked closed again. Bob wasn't really a human skull. He was a spirit of air, sort of like a fairy, but different. He made his residence inside the skull that had been prepared for him several hundred years ago, and it was his job to remember things. For obvious reasons, I can't use a computer to store information and keep track of the slowly changing laws of quasi-physics. That's why I had Bob. He had worked with dozens of wizards over the years, and it had given him a vast repertoire of knowledge that, that and really crotchety attitude. Blasted wizards, he muttered. I can't sleep, so we're going to make a couple of po uh, potions. Sound good? Like I have a choice, Bob said. What's the occasion? I brought Bob up to speed on what had happened that day. He whistled, no easy trick without lips, and said, Sounds sticky. Pretty sticky, I agreed. Tell you what, he said. Let me out for a ride, and I'll tell you how to get out of it. That made me wary. Bob, I let you out once, remember? He nodded dreamily, scraping bone on wood. The sorority house, I remember. I snorted and started some water to boiling over one of the burners. You're supposed to be a spirit of intellect. I don't understand why you're obsessed with sex. Bob's voice got defensive. It's an academic interest, Harry. Oh, yeah? Well, maybe I don't think it's fair to let your academia go peeping in on other people's houses. Wait a minute. My academia doesn't just peep. I held up a hand. Save it. I don't want to hear it. He grunted. You're trivializing what getting out for a bit means to me. Harry, you're insulting my masculinity. Bob, I said, you're a skull. You don't have any masculinity to insult. Oh, yeah, Bob challenged me. Pot kettle black, Harry. Have you gotten a date yet? Huh? Most men have something better to do in the middle of the night than play with their chemistry sets. As a matter of fact, I told him, 
I set up for Saturday night. Bob eyes fluttered from orange to red. Ooh, he leered. Is she pretty? Dark skin, I said. Dark hair, dark eyes, legs to die for. Smart, oh, sexy as hell. Bob chorted. Think she'd like to see the lab? Get your mind out of the gutter. No, seriously, Bob said. If she's so great, what's she doing with you? You aren't exactly Sir Gwain, you know. It was my turn to get defensive. She likes me, I said. Is that such a shock? Harry. Bob drawled, his eyes lights flickering smugly. What you know about women, oh, I could juggle. I stared at Bob for a moment and realized with somewhat sinking feeling that the skull was probably right. Not that I would admit that to him, not in a million years, but he was. We're going to make an escape potion, I told him. I don't want to be all night so we can get I don't want to be all night so we can get to work. Huh? I can only remember about half of the recipe though. There's always room to make two if you're making one, Harry. You know that. That much was true. The process of mixing up an alchemic potion is largely stirring, simmering, and waiting. You can always get another one going and alternate between them. Sometimes you can even do three, though that's a little pushing it. Okay, so we'll make a copy. Oh, come on, Bob chided me. That's dull. You should stretch yourself. Try something new. Like what? Bob's eyes socket twinkled cheerfully. A love potion, Harry. You won't let me out. At least let me do that. Spirits know you could use it, and... No, I said firmly. No way. No love potion. Fine, he said. No love potion. No escape potion either. Bob... I said warningly. Bob's eye lights linked out. I growled. I was tired and cranky, and under the best of circumstances, I'm not exactly a type A personality. I stalked over, picked up Bob by the jaws, and shook him. Hey! I shouted. Bob! You come out of there, or I'm going to take the skull and throw it down the deepest well I can find. I swear to you, I'll put you somewhere where no one can ever let you out again. Bob Eyes winked on for a moment. No, you won't. I'm far too valuable. Then they winked out again. I gritted my teeth and tried not to smash the skull to little pieces on the floor. I took deep breaths, summoning years of wizardly training and control to not throw a tantrum and break the nice spirit into little pieces. Instead, I put the skull back on the shelf and counted slowly to thirty. Could I make the potion by myself? I probably could, but I had the sinking feeling that it might not have precisely the, the effect I wanted. Potions were a tricky business, and a lot more relied on precise details than upon intent, like in spells. And just because I made a love potion didn't mean I had to use it, right? It would only be good for a couple of days. In any case, surely not through the weekend. How much trouble could it cause? I struggled to rationalize the action. It would appease Bob and give him some kind of vicarious thrill. Love potions were about the cheapest thing in the world to make, so it wouldn't cost me too much. And, I thought, if Susan should ask me for some kind of demonstration of magic, as she always did, I could always... No, no, that would be too much. That would be like admitting I couldn't get a woman to like me on my own. And it would be unfair taking advantage of a woman. What I wanted was the escape potion. I might need it to escape Bianca's place. And I could always use it 
if worse came to worst, to make a getaway from Morgan and the White Council. I would feel a lot better if I had the escape potion. Okay, Bob, fine. You win. We'll do them both. All right. Bob's eye lights came out warily. You are sure? You'll do the love potion, just like I say. Don't I always make the potions just like you say, Bob? What about that diet potion you tried? Okay, that one was a mistake. And the anti-gravity potion, you remember that? We fixed the floor, and it was no big deal. And the fine, fine, I growled. You don't have to rub it in. Now, cough up the recipes. Bob did so, in a fine humor. And for the next two hours, we made potions. Potions are made pretty much the same way. First, you need a base to form the essential liquid content. And then something to engage each of the senses. And then something for the mind and something else for the spirit. Eight ingredients, all in all. And they're pretty different for each and every potion. And for each and every person who makes them. Bob had centuries of experience. And he could extrapolate the most successful components for a given person to make it into a potion. He was right about being an invaluable resource. I had never even heard of a spirit with Bob's experience. And I was like lucky to have him. That didn't mean I didn't want to crack the skull of his from time to time, though. The escape potion was made in a base of eight ounces of jolt cola. We added a drop of motor oil for the smell of it, a cut of a bird's feather into tiny shavings for the tactical value, three ounces of chocolate-covered espresso beans ground into powder went in next, then a shredded bus ticket I never used for the mind, and a small chain which I broke and then dropped in for the heart. I unfolded a clean white cloth where I had had a flickering shadow stored for just such an occasion and tossed it into the brew. I then opened up a glass jar where I kept my mouse scampers and tapped the sound out of the beaker where the potion was brewing. You're sure this is going to work, Bob? I said. Always. That's a super recipe there. Smells terrible. Bob's lights twinkled. They usually do. What's it doing? Is this the super speed one or the telepation version? Bob coughed. A little both, actually. You drink it, and you'll be the wind for a few minutes. The wind? I eyed him. I heard, haven't heard of that one before, Bob. I'm an air spirit, after all. Bob told me, this'll work fine, trust me. I grumbled and set the first potion to simmering, then started on the next one. I hesitated after Bob told me the first ingredient. Tequila? I asked him skeptically. Are you sure on that one? I thought the base for a love potion was supposed to be champagne. Champagne, tequila, what's the difference? So long as it'll lower our inhibition, Bob said. Uh, I'm thinking it's going to get us a, um, sleazier result. Hey, Bob protested. Who's the memory spirit here? Me or you? Well, who's got all the experience with women here? Me or you? Bob. Harry? Bob lectured me. I was seducing shepherdesses when you want to twinkle in your great grandsister's eyes. I think I know what I'm doing. I sighed, too tired to argue with him. Okay, okay, sheesh, tequila. I got down the bottle, measured eight ounces into a beaker, and glanced up at the skull. Right now, three ounces of dark chocolate. Chocolate? I demanded. Chicks are into chocolate, Harry. I muttered, more interested in finishing than anything else, and measured out the ingredients. 
I did the same with a drop of perfume, some name-branded imitation that I liked, an ounce of shredded lace, and a last sigh at the bottom of a glass jar. I added some candlelight to the mix and took it on a rosy golden glow. Great, Bob said. That's just right. Okay, now we need to add the ashes of a passionate love letter. I blinked at the skull. Uh, Bob, I'm fresh out of those. Bob snorted. Out, I guess. Look on the shelf behind me. I did, and found a pair of romance novels. Their covers filled with impossibly delighted, delightful fret. Delightful flesh. Hey, where'd you get these? My last trip out, Bob answered blithely. Page 174. The paragraph that starts, Her milky white breasts. Tear that page out and burn it and add those ashes. I choked. That'll work. Hey, women eat those things up. Trust me. Fine, I sighed. This is the spirit ingredient. Uh-huh, Bob said. He was rocking back and forth on his jawbones in excitement. Now, just a teaspoon of powdered diamond, and we're done. I rubbed my eyes. Diamond? I don't have any diamond, Bob. Oh, I figured. You're cheap. That's why women don't like you. Look, just tear up a fifty into really little pieces and put in there. A fifty-dollar bill, I demanded? Money. Bob opinioned. Very sexy. I muttered and got the remaining fifty out of my pocket, shredding it and tossing it in to complete the potion. The next step was where the effort came in. Once all the ingredients are mixed together, you have to force enough energy through them to activate them. It isn't the actual physical ingredients that are important. It's the meaning that they carry to the significance that they have for the person making the potion and for those who will be using it. The energy came from magic, comes from a lot of places. It can come from a special place, usually some spectacular natural site like Mount St. Helens or Old Faithful, from a focus of some kind, like Stonehenge is on a large scale, or from inside the people. The best magic comes from inside. Sometimes it's just pure mental effort, raw willpower. Sometimes it's emotions and feelings. All of them are viable tinder to be used for proverbial fire. I had a lot of worry to use to fuel the magic, and a lot of annoyance, and one hell of a lot of stubbornness. I murmured like the request the requisite quasi-Latin lintity over the potions, over and over, feeling a kind of resistance bubbling just out of the range of physical senses, but there, nonetheless. I gathered up all my worry and all my anger and all my stubbornness and threw them all at the resistance in one big ball, shaping them with the strength and tone of my words. The magic left me in a sudden wave like a pitcher abruptly emptied. I love this part, Bob said, just as both potions exploded into puffs of greenish smoke and began to froth up and over the lips of the beaker. I sagged onto a stool and waited for the potions to fizz down. All the strength gone out of me, the weariness building up like loads of bricks on my shoulders. Once the frothing had settled, I leaned over and poured each potion into its own individual sports bottle with a squeeze top, and then labeled the containers with permanent magic marker very clearly. I don't take chances in getting potions mixed up anymore, ever since the invisibility hair tonic incident from when I was trying to grow out a decent beard. You won't regret this, Ari, Bob assured me. That's the best potion I've ever made. I made it, not you. I growled. I really was exhausted now, way too tired to let petty concerns like possible execution keep me from bed. Sure, sure, Bob agreed. Whatever, Harry. I went over the room, putting up all the fires and putting out the kerosene heater. 
then climbed the ladder back to the basement without saying goodnight. Bob was chorting happily to himself as I did. I stumbled my way to bed and fell into it. Mister always climbs in and goes to sleep draped over my legs. I waited for him, and a few seconds later he showed up, settling down and purring, purring like a miniature outboard motor. I struggled to put together a litany for the next couple of days through the haze of exhaustion. Talk to the vampire. Locate missing husband. Avoid the wrath of the White Council. Find the killer before he found me. An unpleasant thought, but I decided that it wasn't going to let that bother me either, and I curled up to go to sleep. <laughs>